Thank you. Um, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're joining me, uh, joining us this morning. And uh, thanks for being here. Uh, always happy to talk at uh, DevOps Days. It's a it's a great event, and uh, look forward to doing it in person at some point in the in the future uh, again, because that's uh, that's half the fun. Uh, but we'll see if we can make up for the other half today. So I'm going to talk uh, today about uh, the title of the slide uh, or the title of the talk, as you can see, is the Goldilocks problem of software delivery. And really, what I'm going to talk about is why features are the, the the unit of value that we deliver to our customers. And then we need to get a little bit better at uh, looking at those uh, from the perspective of, you know, how do I get this feature out? Where is it blocked? Uh, those sorts of things. And I'll kind of compare and contrast that to some of the other things that we use to drive things uh, out the door uh, and go through that. So that's a little bit of a preview. I also could have sort of called this and, and mixed in a, a great movie here too, The Graduate of, you know, the, the future is features. <clears throat> you know, I have one word for you, son, features. Uh, I couldn't resist throwing that in there because uh, it's such a great movie and, and such a great quote uh, at the time, a little bit dated nowadays, uh, uh, perhaps, but, uh, you know, all, all the more fun for it. So it, just sort of taking a step back a little bit here. So software is at the core of, of pretty much every business today. I mean, if you're making cars or washing machines, you're, you're doing software. Um, that's one of the primary ways in which you're differentiating yourself. Uh, from from your competitors and and trying to get your uh, customers business and and keep them happy, so it's a it's a it's a you know it's kind of the point now where uh, as Andreessen said a few years ago, software will eat the world, but it has eaten the world. Um, it's it's a done deal. We're we're there. Uh, we just have to now get better at uh, at delivering software. Um, a little uh, survey that uh, that we did a, a little while ago about uh, you know companies adopting, for example, microservices. And the point here being kind of, you know, application architecture has a huge impact on our ability to uh, deliver software in a, in a timely fashion and deliver repeatedly uh, and, and with, with good cadence. And so modern, modernization of, of the software function and using microservices as a proxy uh, for, for modernizing uh, software delivery services, that results, adopting that results in a 3x uh, better likelihood of experiencing revenue growth of 15% or more. Um, now, you know, don't take that as the end all be all. I don't think I'm going to pass this off as sort of a scientific survey, but it's an interesting kind of snapshot of the experience that, uh, that companies are having uh, as they adopt more modern uh, software architectures. Um, the, you know, we also have, and, and here is, you know, I would argue, a much more rigorous uh, set of numbers based on the, uh, the DORA uh, uh, research survey, the DevOps uh, research and assessment uh, folks. Um, who do a, um, a, a big, you know, huge survey every year of, of thousands of, of uh, organizations in, in the industry. And, you know, here they call out, and this is, I think, probably from 2019, um, but they call out, you know, the, the really large gap between the elite performers and, you know, the rest of us uh, in terms of, you know, here the sort of the four big DORA metrics that, that we see all the time, the frequency of code deploys, the lead time from commit to deploy, um, mean time to recovery from, from downtime, uh, and, and the likelihood of, of, of changes failing. And, and really, you know, what this calls out, and, and the big thing you want to notice here isn't necessarily the, the, the individual <clears throat> numbers, but the fact that we're not dealing in percentages here, right? We're dealing in orders of magnitude. We're dealing in two, three orders of magnitude that, that differentiates the, the elite performers from, uh, from the rest of the pack. And that's a, you know, that's a significant uh, delta that, you know, there's obviously room for improvement uh, for the industry as a whole to, to grow into, um, because that's, you know, that's the cream of the cream of the crop that's doing it, uh, that's doing it that well. Um, so, so, you know, architecture, we're getting better at, um, <clears throat> we're obviously getting better at things like CI and CD, continuous integration, continuous delivery, uh, continuous testing, uh, for that matter, and, and DevOps. Uh, as a as a process and a culture to do things and are helping, but you know things are still not perfect. Um, you know it's it's not like every team out there, every organization out there is is able to just sort of magically now deliver software uh, as quickly as we can with the quality that we can, um, with all the functionality that we want. It's it's still a difficult problem. And you know a quote here from a, a DevOps leader at a major North American bank. Uh, about, you know, we're doing phenomenally well in our, in our DevOps practice, but if we're unable to have better visibility, measure the actual business impact, 
and connect our software development and delivery practice to the rest of the organization will no longer be competitive in the market and we will have wasted a billion dollars in our DevOps efforts. Um, and, and this really, you know, in a way gets to the heart of the matter, which is that the software that we deliver and the organizations that work to deliver that software, you know, we're in service of the, of the overall business, right? You know, we, we, we have to work with sales, we have to work with product management, we have to work with support, customer success, you know, all the functions, HR, finance, all the functions in, in, in the company to make sure that we're delivering uh, software uh, that that meets the business's needs, that 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 fill the gap that they see in the market, or that you know provide the competitive advantage in in the market, uh, th those sorts of things. But you know, as you can see, even when you start using all of these, um, you know, the architectures, the CI/CD, agile, uh, DevOps, you know, whatever whatever methodology you've chosen to sort of adopt and in what order, because um, obviously there's overlap between a lot of these things. But you know, there's no magic bullet here. You kind of still have to do it right. So we're getting, you know, we're getting good at it. You know, we've embraced CI. We're rapidly iterating on code. So we're kind of doing all those things well. We're, we're building on top of that so that we can do more continuous delivery, uh, which is which is all well and good. But to really kind of truly up level software delivery to you know first class citizen in in in, in the corporation and in, in the enterprise, you know, we need to adopt software delivery as a core business process. And and um, you know, we have, we have challenges there. You know, we, we, we still with all this have developers saying, hey, why am I building this feature? Who asked for it? Who is it for? What are they gonna do with it? Um, why do I have to waste my time troubleshooting deployments? Um, you know, hopefully not too many people are saying that these days or at least not asking why. They might be grumbling that they have to do it, but um, they're not asking why. Um, you know, is my work serving delighting our end users? You know, how, what's the what's the lead time from when I finish my work to when I get to see somebody enjoying the, the fruits of my labors? From an engineering management perspective, you know, why is the release date the most important feature? Um, is, a, is a frequent question I hear, and I've probably said it a few times myself. Um, you know, how can I get better visibility into my team's tools and processes? You know, which which tools are helping, which tools are hurting, which ones are giving me visibility into the where the actual bottlenecks are and which ones are themselves the bottleneck sometimes. Um, how do I burn down the technical debt while embracing modern technology? You know, we, 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 we often forget when we're building software that there are non-functional requirements. Um, you know, we've got a list of features that we need to implement, but there's a lot of other things that need to get done along the way. You know, we need good architecture, we need good resilience, we need good persistence, we need, you know, good design and, and user experience and, and, and all of those things to a greater degree or, 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 or lesser degree are, are functional versus non-functional requirements. And we still need to work about that, of course. And then from a, you know, kind of an ops perspective, and as you can see here, this is very much the, you know, kind of the core product uh, parts of, of, of the organization here. But, you know, from an ops perspective, you know, how do I absorb all this new technology and, and, and app updates safely and, and, you know, put them into production and keep them running in production? How do I enable my developers with self-service? <clears throat> you know, how do I not become a bottleneck in, in getting things out the door and standing up the environments that need to be, uh, you know, stood up? Uh, whether they're ephemeral environments that, you know, come and go very quickly or whether they're longer lived environment uh, uh, environments, what have you, you know. And then if, you know, of course, if you're in an industry that's at all regulated or, or subject to audit or governance requirements, you know, who, who authorized this release? Did it pass all the security and QA tests? What's in it? Why are we delivering this? Um, and, and again, that's just focusing on the, the kind of the core technical heart of, of product, but that's not the entire business, right? We've got the, the CXO, CTO, you know, are we delivering against baselines? Are we being efficient? Uh, are, we, are, we, um, are we being effective? Uh, all, all of those kinds of questions that are very high level questions. Um, from the PM side, you know, where is this feature? Has it been delivered? Has, has anybody used it yet? Have we gotten feedback? Um, what do customers think? Sales and marketing, you know, what features in development can help me solve my customer's needs? And the one that I know can help with this customer's needs, where is it? When is it gonna be delivered? When, was, when will it be available? Will, be, will we have a preview program for it where I can show it to people early? Um, those those, uh, <clears throat> those kinds of questions are going to be very common, and then of course, you know, for support, you know, I'm talking to a customer. Um, what feature flags are enabled for this customer, you know, so that I know what it is that they're looking at, right? Are they in the preview program for this new feature or not? Um, so there's all kinds of questions that kind of need to get asked and, and answered in, in this context. And when we're, you know, when we're in the enterprise context, you know, um, sizable established companies with many products, many teams. 
uh, geographically distributed teams. Um, you know, of course, now we're all to a greater or lesser degree geographically distributed since most of us are, are, are when possible, uh, uh, working from home. But, you know, none, nonetheless, you know, we're, we're even in normal times dealing with distributed teams on, in different countries, different time zones, uh, different continents uh, even. Um, and, and, you know, doing release is, is, is a big enterprise, soft, enterprise software challenge. And, and it's difficult to do, you know, it's, 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 it's reasonable to do when you're dealing with, you know, one app being released into one environment or one set of environments, you know, because you can kind of connect the dots between all the tooling that you bring to bear on this. You know, you, you've got some issue tracking software, you've got some CI builds that you're doing, you've got some quality stuff that you're doing, some automated testing uh, infrastructure, you've got a, um, you know, you've got some UI testing to do, and then you've got an environment that you're going to deploy it into. And it, that, that, that looks straightforward. But, you know, the reality is that when you're in an enterprise, when you're in a sizable uh, company, you're dealing with this times X, right? You, you've got lots of different teams, you've got lots of different products, lots of different environments that come and go. Um, you've got lots of different technology stacks, you know, and, and, and if you're a sizable enough uh, or, or organization and you've been around long enough, you probably also have many different generations of, of, of technology uh, that you have to wrangle uh, and, and maintain and, and use to build on, on top of. And, you know, as, as, as much as it's awesome that, you know, almost every day, it seems like we have a new cool technology that shows up, you know, most of them show up and they, they shine brightly for a few weeks or a few months and then they kind of go by the wayside, but some of them stick, you know, and become very useful, very valuable things uh, that we use to build on going forward. But, you know, it's never the case that we go back and rebuild all the existing applications on top of this new wonderful technology that we have. You know, that would be a little bit like, you know, when, when we change the building codes or when we change the fire codes, we don't go tear down all the existing buildings and rebuild them to the new building code just because now we know, you know, well, you know, we shouldn't use flying buttresses because they're not as uh, resilient as we thought they would. So we got to go tear down all these cathedrals and rebuild them to be, you know, to be a little bit safer. Of course, we don't do that, right? And we don't do that with software either. We don't go rewrite all the applications or all the platforms that we have just because if we were to write them today, we would use a different technology. Sometimes that means we're dealing with technologies that are 5, 10, 15, 50 years old, and, and we have to make do with that. You know, if anything, we can you know, we can strangle them out of existence in terms of, you know, applying the strangler pattern and, and siphoning off uh, various pieces of functionality into new systems if it really is a, a problem that we have that old technology in, in, in the architecture. But it's, it's difficult to do, and you may have a lot of dependencies that you have to deal with when, when, when you do that. So, so kind of getting just to the heart of what I want to talk about today <clears throat> a little bit <clears throat> is what I'm calling the Goldilocks problem of, of software delivery. And I'll go through the, the list here, but it's really just the point of this is features are the unit of value by which we deliver stuff to our customers, right? So I, I as, a, as a consumer of an application, I look for features, right? Um, is, you know, am I able to size the text correctly? Have I added that feature? You know, does it work in night mode and, and day mode on my phone? Or is it going to blast my eyeballs if I, you know, open up that application at five in the morning when I wake up? Uh, the, you know, that's, that's what I care about. I don't care about releases. I certainly as a consumer don't care about builds. Um, but in, but on the other side of the fence, you know, in, in where we're actually building and delivering, delivering uh, software, we're very consumed by things like releases and by builds and rightfully so. This is definitely not an argument that, you know, hey, stop doing releases or hey, stop doing builds. Don't, don't mistake me. But what we need to do is start looking at other things that are in the case of, you know, the, the, the problem with releases is they're too big, right? They're, they're a great organizing principle for, for software teams. Um, uh, you know, you, you, you can't, um, you know, you, 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 you can't just sort of pell-mell necessarily in, in all situations just be throwing software out the door. It just doesn't work that way. If you're in a regulated environment, you need to have some process around that. Um, even if you're very, very up-to-date and, and, and well uh, versed in DevOps and continuous delivery and CI and all of those things, you still need to have a process around how those things go out because you need to coordinate with the real world. Has, have the training materials for this been written? Has this been passed by, you know, by the attorneys? Do we have the regulatory approval for this? Um, you know, all, all of those kinds of things get a little bit more complicated in, 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 in different scenarios, but we tend to bucket these things into releases, you know, and 10, 15, 20 years ago, we were doing releases at, you know, sort of 18 to two month cadences, and in some case, much longer. 
And so, you know, when you look at a feature, not everything that goes, sorry, when you look at a release, not everything in a release is for everyone, right? And I only care about those particular releases or features in a release that, that I care about. The rest is, is fluff. Um, and, and because features are added to and removed from releases all the time, right? If, if you have a kind of a cadence for your releases where a release goes out every month or a release goes out every week or every quarter, then if a feature isn't ready, if it turns out, hey, we thought feature X was gonna be ready, but it's not, um, we need to pull it. So at that point, if I'm the person waiting for feature X, I no longer care about that release. It's no longer, it's, it doesn't exist, it's dead to me. Right. So, so because features, you know, enter and join releases, you know, sometimes at, at very late stages, um, the, the, you know, customers more and more don't really care about releases. Right. And especially, you know, we do such a really kind of terrible job industry wide of release notes. I don't even know what's in most releases when they come out, you know, especially on mobile, you know, I'll call out mobile as a, as a terrible example of, of uh, overall of how to do things like release notes, because 90% of the release notes I see in a mobile app release is bug fixes and performance improvements, right? Okay, you know more than that, hopefully, about what's in the software that you just released. Can you give me a little more detail on this so that I know whether I should care about this? Now, you know, is there a security fix in there? Or do I need to know the, the, the gory details of that? No, but what, what value did you add? What things do you want me to try and go look for, right? There's, there's none, none of that uh, so, so frequently, which I think boils down to people don't know what's going into that release. Their job is just to push it out the door. And that's a little bit of a problem, right? Um, now, on the other hand, you know, about 20 years or so, we started thinking really quite a bit about continuous integration and the build. Right, the build became a paramount thing that, that we focused on, and for good reason, because we were in pretty sad shape, and in a lot of cases still are. Um, you know, we, we, we had processes where people would go off for multiple weeks at a time and write their own code, and then they would come back, and we'd have an integration storm where for another six weeks we'd, we'd go off and just try to make the thing compile again. And you know, continuous integration was a great uh, and very useful uh, um, uh, paradigm when it came along to say, look, you got to be building all the time. You got to make sure that this thing is at the very least building and passing some smoke tests, you know, some unit tests, you know, hopefully more than just a few, but, but that, you know, each and every day that you're committing code that you're building and keeping that build green and making sure that you have a system that's up and running at, at all times, you know, that's a prereq for doing any of the other um, more fancy stuff, continuous delivery, DevOps, you know, those sorts of things. If you can't get your continuous integration um, uh, pipeline up and running and, and providing uh, a, a stable signal to you, then, then you, you know, that, that's very painful. So again, I'm absolutely not saying stop doing releases. I'm absolutely not saying stop doing uh, builds or stop doing CI. But on the other hand, as a, as a consumer of the feature, I really don't care about builds, right? If I don't care about releases because they have a bunch of stuff in them that, you know, A, you're not telling me about, and B, it doesn't have the thing that I wanted to have in there, then I, I don't care about releases. I really don't care about builds, right? Because you're going to do a thousand builds, um, hopefully. Uh, for, for each release that you do. So, so that's too small, right? So you can kind of see where the Goldilocks thing is coming in here where releases are too big, builds are too small. It's features that are just right. Now I'm using a fairly expansive definition of features here, right? So to me, a security fix is a feature, right? Because quality and security are features that we want in, 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 our, uh, in, in our software. But so is adding new functionality, you know, giving me the ability to do something that I couldn't do before or giving me the ability to do something that I've always done with the product, but now do it a lot better or do it a lot faster, or maybe stop doing something that I used to be able to do that was just sort of busy work that I would rather just have it do for me automatically. It's really, it's really features where my experience as a, as a user of your software, as a consumer of, of, of the value that you're putting out in the world, you know, that's where the rubber hits the road, literally. Um, and, and yet, you know, we kind of don't look at it that way very often in, in software organizations, especially large, you know, larger software organizations. For sure, if you're a small team and you're focused on one product and, and that's all you live and care about, then, you know, life is a little bit different for you. But in larger organizations, it's, it's, it's much more um, muddy than that, let's say. Right, so you've you know you've got a product organization, and our goal is to develop our products. You know, here we've got you know kind of generic product A and product B uh, on on this slide, 
And our job is to solve, you know, customer slash user problems and delight our users. And, you know, of course, as a side effect, generate revenue uh, for the business or love or respect or, you know, whatever, whatever currency is, it is that we want to be rewarded in for, for what we do. And, and, you know, we've, we've got a, a, a lot of, uh, a lot of features uh, that we're developing as part of these products, you know, some of them are small, some of them are large. Um, and, you know, our, our job is to get these features out the door on, on a regular predictable cadence um, so that we're, you know, we're competitive, we're innovative, we can differentiate and, and you know, we can delight our users with, with, with the functionality. And we've got a veritable ton of tools that we bring to bear on this, you know, mo most of us with, with, with sizable organizations. We've got dozens, sometimes hundreds of, of various tools that we bring to bear on, on, on this problem, you know. Uh, starting all the way with the whiteboard when we first have our idea and we write that out, which, you know, now there's less and less whiteboarding being done as we're not in the office very more, uh, very much anymore. But, uh, you know, and I, I sort of miss that. I got to figure out what my whiteboard is online. Um, but we've got a, a multitude of tools across a large variety of functions, you know, within the business and speaking not just, you know, kind of to the core product aspects, but to the business as a whole. You know, we've, we've got, you know, issue tracking tools, we've got source code management tools, we've got cloud uh, environments that we're deploying into. We've got things like maybe feature flags uh, that we're using to turn functionality on and off at runtime in production, uh, either to run experiments or maybe to roll things back without actually rolling things back, right? Use, use feature flags to, 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 to hide a feature that you know, turns out has a problem and isn't quite ready yet, or use feature flags to expose only a, a certain set of functionality only to certain users, either only in this area or maybe this percentage of people, or maybe just this one customer who's waiting for this feature and we want their feedback. Um, so, so tons of different tools uh, that, that we're using. Now, these tools tend to be fairly disconnected, right? They're essentially turning into data silos. And, you know, one of the things that we've been very successful at as a whole in the industry over the last decade or so with, with, with Agile, with DevOps, with, with all of the kind of methodologies and cultural things that we're doing is we've gotten pretty good um, at tearing down silos between organizations. Um, not everywhere, not all of them, you know, they're still around, but I think it's kind of recognized across the industry that, you know, you don't just, you know, come up with a bunch of requirements and throw them over the fence to engineering who then sit for six months and write a bunch of code and then throw it over the fence to QA who then, you know, works on it for three months and, you know, throws it over the fence to the customer and kind of the waterfall method that we used to use in the past that, you know, that, that doesn't produce the best outcomes. And we know that. Um, and so we've gotten better at sort of iterating, you know, and, and doing multiple passes through these things and, and making sure that we don't wait until everything is done before we expose uh, that, that functionality to users. You know, we try to work with small batch sizes, for example. But the truth is these tools to a large degree that we use are still silos of data. And so when I want to start asking questions like, you know, where is this feature? Where is it? Is it blocked? What is it waiting on? What do we need to do? Uh, how do I get it unblocked? Um, when is it going to ship? When is it going to be available in preview? Uh, those sorts of questions are still kind of notoriously difficult to, to answer. Um, if, a, if, a, if an engineering manager or product manager or, or, or project manager is tasked with keeping track of those kinds of things, chances are they spend quite a bit of time in, in, in these tools and jumping between these tools and then, you know, probably copying, pasting into, into slide presentations or spreadsheets uh, all of the information that they need on a daily basis to sort of communicate this. And it's, it's a pretty tedious thing to do and subject to errors and interpretations and, and, and all of those kinds of things. And, you know, the, 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 and that's just, you know, focusing on the product specific things, right? Then we've got things that happen upstream and downstream of that. We've got support tooling. We've got performance uh, metrics that we want to be uh, deriving. We, we've got sales support uh, uh, tools that we're using. We've got behavior analytics that we're using to figure out, hey, what, what parts of the product are people using? Where are they getting stuck? Where are they getting confused? All, all of those kinds of things. Some of those things, a lot of those things happen before we write the first line of code. And some of them continue after we write, you know, quote unquote, the last uh, line of code, at least for, 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 for a given release or, or a given feature. So there's a lot of tooling that, that, that we need to rely on. And that provides us with a lot of information, but in a, in a set of silos that, you know, ought to give us the ability to, um, you know, get visibility into this process and know where the blockers are occurring and where feature delivery is being delayed. Um, because sometimes the release isn't being delayed, right? It's an individual feature in that release being delayed. 
And the likely outcome of that is if the feature is delayed enough, it, get kicked, it gets kicked out of the, the release. And so that feature is no longer part of that release. That release goes without that feature. So if I was tracking this at the release level, um, I wouldn't necessarily know that that feature got booted out. And I'd be kind of disappointed that it isn't there when, when, when the release shows up. So, but, but if we are able to track this at, at a release uh, granularity, then, then we're a lot happier, right? Because then we can look at the individual signals coming from the right tools that tell us what, you know, what is the state of this feature? Where, where is it? What's it blocked by? Um, and, and we've got, you know, because we have so many tools involved in this and so many kind of, you know, tool silos or data silos, as a result, um, things are getting blocked. And, and, and sometimes there's a blocker that blocks only one feature and other things can go ahead and the release is, you know, fairly intact. And sometimes you've got something that's blocking that's so fundamental that you can't get anything out on, on a release. And, and the magic really is, is kind of trying to figure out, you know, what is a system-wide blocker? What's a, what's a feature level blocker and kind of where is everything, right? And, and so this is, you know, an everyday thing where, where the teams, you know, expend tremendous effort on a, on a daily basis to kind of just understand where we are in terms of being able to deliver this, this value to our customers and, you know, get them excited about our products, get them excited about how we help them and, and how we make their lives better, at least their, their professional lives and sometimes their personal lives. Um, but, you know, that, that's, that's a full-time job just to keep track of, of, of all of that stuff and, and usually for several people. And what we want to do is kind of make sense of all this information. And, and my, my, my strong opinion here is that it's, it's at the feature level that this starts to make sense to track, right? The release level is too big because features are going to come and go. I'm going to add a feature. I'm going to remove a feature. So depending on who the target is for that particular feature, they just started caring a lot about that release if I just threw a good feature into it, or they just stopped caring at all if I took out the feature that they care about, right? So if I'm, I'm going to target that customer, whether that's an individual customer, an important account, or whether it's a whole segment of, of, my, uh, of my customer base that I, you know, that I want to service with, with some cool functionality, um, that, you know, I need to know. Um, and I need to, you know, to, to figure that out. And so really, to the, to the extent that you can, you want to get yourself in a position where you've got one place where you can go look at this stuff uh, and, and be able to look across all of your dis different systems and all of your different data silos and start to answer, ask and answer some of these questions around, you know, what are the blockages here? What things are cranking away in a, in a, in a useful way? And, and what things are blocked? And, and as a result of that, not just, you know, hey, a build failed. Right. That's, of course, important information, but builds fail all the time, quite frankly. The question is, what's the impact of that build failing? You know, was it was, you know, does does that build failing mean that I now can't commit changes to feature X, which is a really important feature because I want to hold off on that until we clear out this, this build problem? Or maybe was the build problem caused by feature X? And, you know, that's something we need to jump on right away. Um, but you want to, you know, you want to get yourself in a position where you think in terms of, OK, what's the impact of that? on the core features that I'm trying to get out the door, you know, this week, next week, this month, next month, this quarter, next quarter, uh, so on. Because obviously, you know, some things are, are quick to build and some things take, you know, quite a lot longer time. They need to be broken down uh, into, uh, into, into smaller pieces so we can divide and conquer. Um, but the key really is to get, in, to, to get visibility, you know, into the features and the contributions to those features, which are going to be in the, you know, in, in the form of, you know, code or designs or, you know, builds or tests or, you know, all the various uh, things that we, that we uh, all the tooling and, and processes that we, uh, that we subject the code to. And really what you then want to do is, you know, focus on unblocking the features that are important, you know, that, that, that are the, the game changing or, or needle moving features and, and, and focus on those. Um, and, and when you can connect the software delivery process here to the cross-functional teams in the organization so that we all have that same view on how we're doing, um, that is a very powerful position to be in, right? Because now we can have that conversation, not at the level of, oh, this release is late or, um, it's still going to go on time, but we're not going to ship these features. We, we, we can have that conversation with much more certainty and, and, and with much more information around, okay, this feature is blocked here, that feature is blocked here, this one's doing fine, this one's already out, but we're getting some feedback that says, you know, the, the thing that we thought we didn't need to do, in fact, turns out to be really important. So we got to go back and add that as quickly as we can, because, you know, important segments of, 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 of that customer community aren't really able to take advantage of that feature as much as we hoped that they would be able to. So you can now start to have, you know, more high level 
um, uh, discussions and, and more sort of um, uh, discussions at an, at an appropriate granularity for, for, for being successful uh, in, in getting the you know, getting our value out to the market so that our customers can, can, can use it and, and, and keep going. So in that, you know, in that vein, you know, just some practical advice here, right? This is, you know, fairly generic advice, I'll, 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 I'll admit, but it really gets to the, a little bit to the heart of, of, of what you want to do. So, you know, understand your value stream. Um, you know, value stream mapping can be a very valuable exercise. It's not the end all and be all. Um, and, it, and it's also something that if you do it once and then you change a bunch of things, now your value stream map is, is you know, if you don't keep it up to date, it's now out of date and, and probably not doing you any favors. Um, but, it, but it really, you know, the thing I like about, you know, focusing on value streams is that it, it kind of forces you to look at, okay, what is the journey that a feature takes from, you know, when it's a gleam in somebody's eye to when I've, you know, I've written the code for it. I've done the design work for it. I've done the implementation for it. I've done the testing, the verification, the qualification of this feature, and it's now on its way out the door, right? I, I understand what all the pieces are, what, are the, what all the gates are, all the processes, all the tools, all the departments, people, groups, uh, stake, stakeholders that are involved in that. Because if I don't know that, then I'm operating blind, right? So at some level, some portion of your product teams need to have that picture in their head, right? Not everybody needs to know that, um, but the more people that do and understand that, the better, right? Because then they can place the work that they do in the context of, 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 of where it's happening. Um, a, a second thing, and, and, and this is uh, something that I learned from, from Gary Groover, and if you haven't read Gary's books on, on how he implemented Agile at HP and, and how he's been working with software leadership teams over the years, I highly recommend Gary Groover's uh, uh, books on this stuff. And he does a lot of online training and, and courses and those sorts of things too. Um, but he talks about how it's really important that you have a stable quality signal coming from, you know, I'm going to be specific here, your continuous integration and or continuous testing systems that, you know, I mean, basically if you can't go to your CI system and just kick off a no change build, do that 10 times and have the same result every time, you've got a problem that you need to address there because you need to be able to rely on your automated systems, which you know, kind of begin at the CI level and, and then hopefully go more into you know, continuous pipelines, continuous testing, continuous delivery type things. But if your CI and CT um, quality signal isn't stable, um, that's a big deal. And what I mean by stable is literally that. If I can't, you know, if I have a successful build and then I make no changes to the code, but then I just run that same build with no changes 10 times in a row, do I get the same results 10 times in a row? Because if I have flaky tests, I won't. And flaky tests are the devil. Get rid of them. You know, just turn them off if you have to, right? Fix them ideally, but you know, turn them off. Don't, don't let them be something that introduces instability into, into your quality signal. Um, you know, are, are the builds running in approximately the same time uh, uh, period every, every, every time you run them? You know, or do they have stable dur duration? Those sorts of things. Very important that you have that because without that, you don't have... Uh, a, a stable signal that tells you what the state of your builds are, because you're going to have lots of kind of false positives, or I guess technically a false negative in the sense that your build isn't working. Um, it's very important uh, to have that. So I, I, I definitely want to want to focus uh, and, and, and put some light on that. Um, third, you know, understand where features get blocked in your process and knowing what you know about your value stream and what it looks like and knowing what you know about where you're getting your signals from in the system know where you get stuck and know where you have problems. You know, are you, are you, getting, are you getting stuck in architecture? You know, we're still trying to figure out how to build this. We, we don't know how to build this. We don't know how to scale this part. You know, is that where you're stuck? Um, are you stuck in design? You know, oh yeah, we need to make this simple, but you know, we have four installers and we need one and we can't figure out how to you know, answer all the questions in one place. And you know, are, you, are you stuck in a, in a design conundrum? You know? Are you stuck in implementation? Oh my goodness, this was much more code than we thought it was gonna be, or this library that, that we thought were going to, was gonna help us a lot just isn't helping as much, or you know, th those, those kinds of scenarios. Pay attention to that. You know, are you stuck in quality? You know, hey, we keep trying to use this feature, but I get an er error every time I do it. So I don't think this feature is really ready. I don't think it's finished. It's not done. Um, security, you know, we've got third party libraries with vulnerabilities. We need to fix that before we ship. Um, or, or we have we have a library that's in production that now has a vulnerability disclosed that's been in there the whole time and we need to remediate that as quickly as possible. You know, that's gonna impact things. Um, the delivery aspects, the factory aspects, of course, you know, 
can we can we get the you know can, is the machine working you know is is the is the conveyor belt moving um, or are the builds broken or are the tests failing or are they flaky are we having to roll back out of our staging environments or even our production environments um, understand these kinds of blockages and understand you know is this blockage is it a system level blockage that's preventing you know all features for this product or maybe even all products from moving forward or is it just something that's kind of a product level blockage or a feature level blockage because then you know how serious they are and if it's a low level you know kind of background feature and it's blocked you know you can address that in a certain way if it's you know a very important very critical feature then you know you got you know you got to throw some uh, you know you got to throw some love on that and and and, and make sure to uh, to get it unblocked and, and agile tooling is your friend in all of this, right? You know, you kind of want to calibrate and discover how features are represented in your agile, you know, data model, as I'm kind of referring to it here, you know, basically, you know, are you using, you know, Jira, are you using version one, or, you, you know, are you using, you know, GitHub issues, or however it is that you're tracking these kinds of things, you know, where, where do your features live, you know, are they, do they live in here as tasks, as stories, as epics, as initiatives, as themes, a little bit of both, you know, kind of understand where they live in your data model, because that's going to be one place where you, where you want to track them. And that doesn't necessarily tell you everything because, you know, you may have checked in something and marked something as completed, but it's not building. So, you, you know, you obviously need signals from other systems other than, you know, your issue tracking uh, systems, but you need to understand how these things show up uh, in, in, in your issue tracking systems. Uh, and a, and a, a shout out to feature flags. Feature flags are an enormously powerful and useful thing uh, to, to, to help you in this. You know, the ability to dynamically enable or disable a feature in production, you know, by region, by customer, by segment, by, you know, by individual person is, is incredibly powerful, right? You really can decouple feature deployment from feature release because you can start to early deploy your, your, your new feature into production and just not expose it to anyone, you know, keep it hidden until you know you're ready and maybe expose it to a small segment of, of your customers, you know, your preview customers, or maybe expose it to, to, to inside uh, users in your own company. And, and then as you get more confidence in it, and as you see that it's working, you know, you can, you can broaden the, the, the access to it. And that allows you to roll things out and decouple the deployment from the release, which is something that I think we all would, would like to do and be able to do reliably. You can roll out features gradually and selectively. You can test in production. Right, and you can shorten feedback loops dramatically by using feature flags to, to do that. You can even provide custom, customized end user experiences. You know, we've got a rich set of functionality in the product, but really we've got three personas that we service, right? And for example, and you know, we can turn off all the, all the Chrome, so to speak, uh, for all the functionality that this, that this customer segment or this customer persona doesn't use. So they're not distracted by that stuff and you can use feature flags to do that. Um, you know, reducing the risk of changes is a good thing too, because you, you don't necessarily need to roll back or even roll forward. Toggle, you know, turn that feature off uh, if it's causing you a problem. If you just rolled it out and it's not working, you know, normally what we would do is, you know, in the old days, we'd roll back and restore the old functionality, but that's fraught with terror, you know, because have I made database changes? Do I need to undo those database changes? What, what you know, what, you know, can I ro roll back reliably or do I need to roll forward? Maybe we like to roll forward and what we do is we go back and we, we remove that code and we push out a new version. Well, feature flags allow you to do those kinds of changes, you know, kind of turn things on and turn things off without having to redeploy the code. And that's, you know, that, that's, really, that's really valuable. On the flip side, you can also end of life features very gradually. You know, if you have a, a certain customer segment that uses a feature that you'd like to, you know, sunset or, or end of life, you can turn it off and, and remove it from those customers who don't use it. So nobody starts to use it. Um, and then you can sort of, you know, gradually wean off uh, your, your customers that do use it uh, from, from that. Um, and, you know, and this is very important is that the, this feature access, you can now start to have it in the hands of not just dev and ops, but in the hands of product owners. And, and, and so the business starts to get a voice in and the ability to kind of throw the, the, the levers and, and turn the knobs on when we, when we, uh, when we um, uh, expose uh, functionality to, to, our, uh, to our customers. Uh, and I'm going to skip a little bit past here and just show a couple of sort of, hey, wouldn't it be nice if, you know, screenshots. So what we really want are these kinds of, uh, you know, dashboards where I can see, you know, I've got some in progress, uh, some in progress features here um, that I'm that I'm working and building on. And I can see what my progress is. I can see how much idle time we have. You know, we're close to being done on the artist recommendations feature, 94% progress. So 60% of the time is idle time now. So there's probably some last minute thing that you know, some part of the team is working on. And I'd like to be able to dig into that. You know, I've got a, 
I've got a red uh, alert here. So probably what I'll do is dig into that a little bit and see what the blockage is. But now I know that for this feature. Similarly here for the song favoriting feature here, kind of in the middle of the slide, you know, we're not very far along. We're not very idle because we're working hard at it. We've got a couple of blockers, you know, that, you know, that may not be a big deal right now because we're just at the beginning, but hey, I might still click through and, 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 and kind of go look at it. You know, and I want to be able to look at the overall kind of stream, uh, if you will, or, 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 or flow of, of how my functionality is making it out, out the door and, and where I'm blocked. And then once I start to do that, now I can start to do some really high value things around efficiency. You know, when, when I look at something in terms of features, it's a pretty hard metric. You know, hey, it took us X number of weeks or days to get this feature from when we had the idea to when it's in the hands of, of, of customers and to know that that's a hard measure that that's not being proxied by releases, which had a bunch of other stuff in it, you know, so that may have been delayed um, and, 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 and those kinds of things. I can start to look at, you know, kind of much more hardcore uh, what the, uh, you know, what, what, what are the things that are impediments? Where do I get stuck? You know, do I have, you know, in, in this one, we can see we have an average uh, uh, day of, of uh, or average time for a pull request to be approved of four days, one hour. For some teams that might be fantastic, for some teams that might be terrible. Right, so that's obviously uh, contextual, whether that's a good uh, amount of time for a pull request to set or whether that's a bad amount of time for a pull request to set, but now you know. Um, and, and you know, that goes along with a lot of other metrics that you, that you probably wanna look at to figure out, uh, you know, how efficient you're, you're, you're being. You know, and again, if, you know, if you're doing feature flags, right, you, you wanna know what are the states of, of the various feature flags. You know, I've turned it on for internal employees and, I've, and the automated rollout has, has happened. I've turned it on for my preview customers and that role that has happened. I haven't rolled it out to any geographical locations um, and I've got some metrics, you know, some policies that I'm, that I'm, that I'm looking at here uh, on the bottom and in, in, in terms of, you know, API response times, error rates, you know, th those sorts of things. And, you know, most of them are green, but one of them's yellow. So I may want to take a look at that, right? But I've only exposed it to internal employees and to preview customers. So I'm probably in pretty good shape here. You know, I need to go look at the, 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 the API response time and, and maybe do a little bit of fixing around that. But, but all in all, I'm doing, I'm doing pretty well. Um, so just sort of returning uh, to, to my thesis here, we've got a couple of uh, minutes left here. So I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna sort of stop with this slide here. And if we have any questions we wanna, uh, we wanna take uh, in chat or, or through the audience, we have a, uh, we have a chance to do that. Uh, and, if, and if not, we can just contemplate the slide for a couple of minutes uh, before we uh, move on to the next presentation. Great, thanks Anders. Um, it doesn't look like we have, um, oh, we got one question. Okay. How can we get started with value stream mapping? So there are lots, um, the, first of all, there's lots of companies out there that will train you and help you with that. So, so that's one approach that you can take if you have the, the time and the, the resources to do that. There's also books out there that, that talk about how to do it. But fundamentally it's, it's you know, my non-expert, you know, I'm not a value stream mapper, you know, professional in that sense. I just, you know, I've been a part of it and, and experienced it, but it's, it's really about um, taking a step back as much as you can, getting all the people, you know, in the same room that we do that virtually these days, of course, but, but, you know, making sure that all the stakeholders are available so that we can do, you know, the goofy analogy I have is, you know, you want to put a GoPro camera on your source code's head, and then you want to sort of imagine that you're you're watching everything that's going to happen to that source code as it comes you know out of the you know first of all off of the whiteboard where we have the idea and then then onto the keyboard as it gets typed in and then we have designs that come along for it and then we build it and then we test it and then we release it and you really want to sort of pay attention to what are the what are all the things that happen to it because you know one, one thing i've seen in a lot of value stream mapping exercises is that a lot of times what happens is nothing um it, you know there's no time on task we're just in a waiting state, you know, we're waiting for an approval or we're waiting for a test to run or we're waiting for an environment to be created or, 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 or those kinds of things. And one of the nice things about value stream mapping, if nothing else, it does give you a picture into, you know, if, if it takes us 30 days to get a, a feature, you know, kind of from ideation to, to where it's out in production, what percentage of that 30 days is actually somebody, you know, nose to the millstone, nose to the grindstone doing work and what is just waiting around. And it's kind of shocking most of the time how high the percentage is of just waiting around. It's often 90, 95% of just sitting waiting around. And out of that 30 days, 
you might have spent three, four, five days of, of you know, kind of, you know, effort, time on task. Um, so I would say, you know, there's training courses out there. There's companies that will help you do it. There's lots of good material in the literature out there to do it. Get educated on it a little bit before you dive into it, because, uh, you know, doing it right requires doing a, doing a few things, uh, doing a few things well. But it's well worth the effort in my experience.